So I'm Robin Lloyd, and uh, I'm co-chair of Disarm, Wolf Disarm. Um, that's the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. And I'm assisted as host for this webinar, or it's web conversation, uh, by Ellen Thomas. And we're recording it and plan to post it at the Wilf US Facebook page um, as soon as possible. We're keeping all uh, attendees muted until we open up the meeting for questions after the four speakers have spoken. Please use the chat option, which is at the bottom of the window. Um, if you want to ask a question of the panelists and Ellen will be uh, taking, will be um, so I am wearing this necklace of peace cranes, uh, which I just received in the last week, um, in honor of the survivors of the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, whose supporters in Japan um, sent them to us to help us draw attention to the fact that this is a 75th anniversary of those horrific events which are changed their lives and ours forever. Anniversaries like this bring out memories and have resonance, not only for the survivors, but also for the general public. We thought that the best way to observe this is to go back to that tumultuous year. 1945, examine the history behind events and ask how could such a destructive weapon be allowed to be created and then used not only once, but twice. What deepened our interest was realizing that the year 1945 was also the year of the creation of the United Nations, which ostensibly is committed to removing the scourge of war from humanity but doesn't seem to be able to make much progress because of the undemocratic way the UN was set up with a five member security council that can veto what the other 188 nations vote into law. So we created a timeline and now Ellen may uh, use this screen to show you a glimpse of it. Um, a timeline of the interwe interweaving of the developments leading to these two events, the, the drive towards finding a way to cooperate between nations and build peace, and the other sending the signal to the world that the most powerful victor of World War II now has the power to destroy humanity. We will include the link to the timeline on our Wilf US Facebook page. So we're thrilled today to, um, in, in launching our timeline and our series of discussions, to be talking to a member of the Kings Bay Plowshares 7 uh, about some of the motives the defendants there, and there were seven of them, of course, had what their, what their motives were in crossing the fence. Um, into the Trident submarine base in Georgia and pouring their blood on iconic symbols of nuclear holocaust in 2018, two years ago. These seven members of the Catholic worker community have long and consistently uh, felt the need to reveal the true crime that is being committed at the, at, at the Trident base, where one fourth of all US nuclear weapons are deployed on 10 submarines which patrol the seas, holding all humanity hostage with the threat of radioactive devastation and potential extinction, which can be launched at the whim of a tyrant or by accident. The defendant's attorneys argued that they should be able to use the necessity defense, but the judge ruled, uh, uh, denied their, their motion. So today we're going to hear from peace and social activist Martha Hennessy, granddaughter of Catholic worker founder Dorothy Day, about what happened on April 4th, 2018, and what led to her joining with six other Catholic workers to cross the line and risk years of prison for their action. Then we would like to go to, uh, then we will hear from Bill Quig Quigley, 
uh, a key member of the team of lawyers supporting the defendants, and what happened when he spread the necessity defense in the courtroom. He will be followed by Bill Nelson, part of another team of lawyers who back in 1984, uh, was allowed to plead the necessity defense um, and um, and and what happened uh, and the wonderful things that happened as a result of that. And finally, John LaForge has written a history <laughs> perversion of justice that allows judges to remove motives from a defendant's argument. And he writes for Nuke Watch uh, quarterly paper and Today he is on with us from Germany. So this is wonderful. Okay, so um, Martha, would you like to start? So glad you're here and you're in our state for now, and I hope you will be able to stay in our state of Vermont. Um, after the sentencing. Oh, okay, and this is Dorothy Day's grand. There she is. Thank you so much. Um, Robin, um, Robin and I have had a chance to um, be together with other conferences. It's it's really wonderful um, to be here. Um, thanks for putting this together. And I just want to say I've got John LaForge's shirt on um, for uh, Occupy Wall Street or Flood Wall Street, uh, one of the demonstrations that we went to in New York some years ago where they handcuffed a polar bear. Um, <laughs> Um, so I guess I'll start by speaking about what our motives were. I mean, I'm speaking for myself. Um, I can't necessarily speak for all seven of us, and, and hopefully I articulate myself in a way that, um, you know, brings justice to how everyone else feels. Um, but the, I think maybe the first and foremost concern was one of um, preventing a crime, preventing a Holocaust, preventing massive casualties and the destruction of the environment. Um, we understand that the uh, doomsday clock is now 100 seconds to midnight, the closest it's ever been in our lifetimes. And so we understood that the current times um, were dangerous times. And, you know, it was a lifetime discernment really in the end to, you know, be able to prepare oneself for such a, a step to take and to all, always do it within the context of uh, community uh, and our faith. We wanted to raise the issue um, of the legality of the nuclear weapons um, in federal court to force the federal court to allow expert testimony, you know, to hear the case about the legality of these weapons. And we also clearly wanted to uh, bring attention to the Trident, the specific um, Trident uh, submarine uh, weapons system. And thus we chose that particular site. Um, so that's what I would say about our motives or my motives. And uh, you had asked the question about um, what would I have said if I had been allowed or any of us had been allowed to use the necessity defense. Um, you know, we were stripped of any defense um, at 1015 Friday night um, in that October before the following Monday we were appearing in court for the jury selection. And, you know, we were given 40, 48 hours notice that we had no defense and that was uh, justification, necessity, um, religious uh, freedom, uh, expression of our religious beliefs and uh, international uh, law. I think those were the three that we tried to focus on. And what I tried to um, present during the trial was um, pictures of Hiroshima. Um, there was this incredible um, photo album that really um, shows what happens with the dropping of a bomb. And when my attorney and I were putting our case together, I showed her these pictures. She had never seen them. She's probably in her 40s. And she just turned away in tears 
um, it just affected her so uh, at such a visceral level to see those pictures and we were not allowed to show them. And the second thing that I wanted to read was the article that Dorothy wrote, uh, We Go on Record, The Catholic Worker Response to Hiroshima. And of course, that was a very strong, very Catholic, very lone voice at that time, um, expressing her utter outrage at what we had done. I also would have spoken about, um, in my profession as an occupational therapist, I have worked with um, children who, who possibly were exposed to depleted uranium and you know had extra digits and had organs outside of their body cavity, things like that. And you know, I would have talked about um, Fallujah, what happened in Fallujah. I mean, that is nuclear war, what, using depleted uranium. And of course, I would have talked about the treaties, the Non-Proliferation Treaty, um, the treaty, treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. Um, I think that Trump had kicked over the Iran deal in the IMF Treaty after our action, if I'm remembering the timeline properly. And of course, Francis Boyle, he had given us the most incredible um, declaration of really spelling it out about the these treaties the importance of these treaties and the illegality the, the deliberate obvious illegality of these weapons to threaten to use them and i also would have talked about how pope francis has called catholics to um, really raise a voice. It's not, it's not enough to uh, simply speak about it. We actually have to um, act on it. And so those are the things that I would have um, brought up in the trial. Thank you. Did they allow you at least to re refer to Isaiah and the plowshares and why you call yourselves plowshares and, and that the trident uh, is, is a is a sword that needs to be transferred and transformed into a uh, plowshare, or I, I don't know how. Yeah, we, we certainly um, did our biblical study and, and our quoting um, throughout the trial. I think that a lot actually was allowed to be said, but it was in the context or on a level that didn't matter. <laughs> didn't matter with regard to the law. Um, you know, it, it, was a, it was a mock trial, of course. It was very, very controlled um, in terms of what the jury was allowed to um, know and understand. I mean, they, they just had no capacity to um, make any judgment based on um, what they were allowed to hear and see with regard to this case that was in front of them. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you so much. Um, the next uh, person we'd invite to speak is uh, Bill Quigley, who is a law professor and director of the law clinic uh, at, the, at Loyola University. And I know uh, Bill from back in, uh, back in being concerned about Haiti through the Center for Constitutional Rights. And also he was one of the lawyers when I crossed the line and did my one three-month heroic stand and went to jail with the School of America's Watch. And uh, that has been, an, I think you've been involved with that in an ongoing basis. And they, that has been a wonderful uh, challenge to the military industrial complex, the um, Fort Benning, Georgia, and the yearly protests that we made there, um, which are not happening now anymore. But, but Bill, please, please uh, let us know. Have you tried to explain to use the necessity defense in other trials, and how, how you know how can they deny it? That's I guess my basic question. So thank you, Robin. Uh, this is Bill Quigley. I uh, live in New Orleans and work at Loyola Law School here. And uh, it's an honor to be with this group and uh, uh, I'm very excited to be able to discuss this important point. 
I think to uh, put it into context, this is ever since there have been laws going back thousands of years, there have been people who said that law is not just and that law is not right and therefore I'm not going to follow that law because there's something more important that's going on here. And that goes back into uh, stories of uh, Moses. It goes back into, you know, uh, all history have people who realize that law does not equal justice. And there are, there are certainly plenty of instances where it is the, the law is not as important as the justice, the injustice that the law is protecting. And I have uh, represented people in uh, state court and federal court across the country uh, uh, for human rights issues in Latin America, for climate justice issues, for uh, <clears throat> drones, for uh, other plowshares actions and the like. And um, what we have found is that the government is really, really afraid to allow people who engage in civil disobedience to be able to explain to the jury what they are doing and why they did it and to put on the kind of evidence that's important to put on to educate people. Because by and large, most people's lives are full of other things. And if you go into a community, as in South Georgia, the fact that there's a nuclear uh, weapons uh, delivery system there is something that's been there their whole lives. They've sort of taken it for granted. They usually don't think about that. That's the same sort of thing that we found in Knoxville, in Tacoma, in North Dakota, South Dakota, other places. And um, uh, the necessity defense essentially is this. It is where a person says, yes, I may have violated a small law, but I did that in order to prevent a larger evil, a larger injustice. And the example that is usually used is a person, if any one of us would walk down the street we would not have the right to just go break into somebody's house and go through their locked door, break their windows and that sort of stuff. We wouldn't have a right to do that because that's a crime. But if we, when we were walking down the street, we saw that there was a small child in that house and that house was on fire, then the, the law would understand that the justice says that breaking and entering into a house in order to try to save a small child's life is certainly justice would say that violating that small law is not all that important and a person should not suffer the consequences for that. And that is what the history of the plowshares and many, many other groups of people across our history, history, people who freed slaves, women who fought for and actually voted when it was illegal to vote, people who organized labor unions, civil rights movement, the environmental rights movement, the disability rights movement. Uh, lately the immigrant rights movement and the like, that uh, the climate justice movement, where people are trying to uh, take the risk, they're willing to take the risk, as these seven brave people have done, take the risk of being arrested and having to be tried and maybe even facing a several years in prison. They take that risk in order to illustrate to the uh, community at large the injustice that these laws are focused, uh, that these laws are protecting. In, the, in our case, the most recent case, the Kings Bay Plowshares, the government wanted to just erase the fact that this was a nuclear weapons delivery facility. They wanted to erase the fact that the nuclear submarines that were there um, uh, were hundreds of times more powerful than the, all the bombs dropped at the end of the Second World War. They wanted to make this just all about cutting a fence and doing some vandalism and they were, did not want the defendants to be able to talk about nuclear weapons, put on experts about nuclear weapons, be able to show evidence of what nuclear weapons do, to do as Carmen Trotta has pointed out, is the, the crime of nuclear weapons is not just when they are used, just as the same as the crime of somebody who does an armed robbery. If they hold a gun up to your head and they do not shoot it, that is an armed robbery. It is the use of that weapon. And that w those weapons, we are holding those weapons up to the heads of people all over this world, including our own. We don't realize that many times. But, uh, and so the idea was to be able to put on scientists, be able to put on doctors, be able to put on philosophers and theologians and bishops and other, other people to help educate the jury about this. And the, core, the prosecution, the government, the U.S. government, fought tooth and nail to make sure that 
that, that this was, had nothing to do with what the jury was going to hear. They wanted this to be as if these individuals cut a fence for a used car lot and went in there and spray painted on some abandoned cars. It's just that simple. It has nothing to do with the fact that it was a nuclear weapons facility. It has nothing to, to do with life and death issues. And they were successful and they have been successful time and time again against plowshares actions and the like. What we have found, and I, I think John will talk some more about that and, and maybe Bill Nelson, uh, is that there, when there is an opportunity for people to be able to tell the rest of the story, um, the courtrooms are really small and they want that courtrooms to be even smaller to just talk about law. They do not want to talk about justice. They do not want to talk about the big picture. They want to just keep it narrowly focused to the small picture because when the big picture is allowed to be painted and illustrated, the jurors and the judge and even the courtroom personnel say, aha, I understand why these folks did it. And I understand the warning that they are trying to give. And I understand why they are risking their freedom to be able to do this and will often find the people not guilty. Um, but it becomes then a teach-in, it becomes an educational process, it becomes truly a political process. And what we found is that the federal courts are extremely hostile to this. And the federal prosecutors in Georgia, I'm sure were in touch with the federal prosecutors in Knoxville, who were in touch with the federal prosecutors in Colorado and Washington and North Dakota and the like, all these other places that the other hundred, uh, the other hundred uh, plowshares have come in. And so they work very hard to make sure this doesn't happen. But what there have been some victories, even some recent victories for the use of the necessity defense in state courts across the country. Recently, there have been things in the Northwest and the Northeast where people in state prosecutions for civil disobedience were able to explain uh, the climate necessity defense, ex have people testify and have experts to talk about, we are literally trying to prevent the end of the world. The same thing that Martha Hennessy and the rest of the plowshares people were trying to be able to do. And it is very powerful and often results in people being found innocent mm -hmm. or guilty. And so the federal courts, very hostile. The state courts, it's a patchwork. People trying it. Sometimes it's useful. Sometimes it's not useful. In this case, uh, it has not, the, the court uh, and the prosecutor came together and said, no way are we gonna let this happen because that would be justice. We get a just outcome instead of a legal outcome. So I've gone over my time, so I will stop with that and happy to answer some questions after you have the other people speak. Uh -huh. Okay, thank you. That's very enlightening, uh, Bill. Um, so a bit, Bill Nelson, there you are. Um, Bill Nelson is an appellate attorney from uh, Middlebury and he was part of a group of lawyers that um, that argued for us uh, that when you before there were actually just I think 23, 26 died on trespassing charges in November of 1984 for trespassing into the office of uh, Senator Stafford because he refused to even meet with us to talk about what was going on in Central America and about his vote to support the Contras uh, in Nicaragua. So um, somehow or other, Bill and the others got uh, the judge to permit to present a necessity defense. And so um, tell us about it. What was this like? It was a wonderful case. <laughs> it, was a, it was great. Uh, it was the case where everything went right. Um, it, um, and that, that has never happened before or since in my experience. The first thing that went right was the, the judge. We, we somehow, for just by chance, got a guy named um, Frank Mahady, who everybody on the defense side thought was wonderful. He was, one, he was, he was very smart. He was very good on procedural and evidentiary issues. He was a, a son of a gun for sentencing, but all the way to, to that, he was great. And he was the nicest man who ever walked the earth. He was just a sweetheart. He was, 
He respected everybody. He respected the defendants. He, um, he, was, he was good to the lawyers. He was great. Um, so that was, that was number one. Um, number two was the prosecutors made some blunders at the outset. One was, um, we were the, the Winooski 44, but um, it was, how many was it? 20, 20 something? <clears throat> um, the, the, the law says that, that the defendant gets six peremptory challenges, six, six um, jurors who can be called off the case for no reason at all. And peremptory challenges, both sides get, get that. Now, we had 20 odd defendants times six is a lot of peremptory challenges. Um, and it wasn't whereas the prosecutor would be stuck with it's, it's six. It was only one party after all the state of Vermont. So there, there was some negotiation that I wasn't a party to, um, which ended up with, given, with us having, I, I can't remember how many, but a ton of peremptory challenges with no objection from the prosecutor. Um, so our jury was pretty much every lefty in Burlington was, <laughs> um, was on our jury. We, we, we knew, the defendants knew, not I, but the defendants knew many of the people who were on the jury um, and knew that they would be for us. So we had kind of, you know, by hook or crook, we had a, a we, were, we were right at, out of the gate with, a, with big advantages. Um, there was, I think, I think the pro, I can't remember this clearly, but I think the prosecutor made another big mistake, which was to not to object to our introduction of necessity defense evidence, but to, but, but reserve the right to object to any jury instructions which would have allowed the jury to acquit on the basis of necessity of defense. Um, that, you know, that, that was dumb of them. And, and it, it gave us, I think without any um, argument, without any struggle, gave us the kind of, of trial um, that, that Bill and, and the others have been talking, talking about, have not been able to get. Uh, any time recently. So, um, and uh, our witnesses were wonderful. Uh, uh, we, we had, I think, Ramsey Clark and Howard Sin. Um, we had um, a Princeton, famous Princeton professor whose name I can't remember, um, talking about international law. Our, the legal the legal group, and we all got along well, um, included public interest lawyers, me from the public defense, um, legal aid lawyers as well, and some lawyers in private practice. In fact, the, who was, the guy who was essentially the head of the team, although then didn't really need to be a head because we were all working together, was Bill Dorsch, who was mainly a divorce lawyer. Um, Sandy Baird was there. Um, I can't remember who, who else, mm -hmm. but we were a good group. Um, where was I? Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> Can I say that the other person I think you missed was Jack McCullough? You remember that? Jack McCullough, Jack and, McCullough and a woman named legal Joan, aid lawyer, yeah, and Joan Bauer, right? Right, and Joan Bauer, yes, mm -hmm. and. Um, and the trial went beautifully. The, um, the place where the prosecutor was, had reserved to put up a fuss, no jury instructions. This is not a, you've heard a lot of stuff, but it's not legally relevant, was their line. Um, we beat them on that. And I think 
um, partly because there weren't many, but at that time there weren't the kind of precedents that precedents um, that have that, that have developed since that um, that justify the uh, exclusion of of necessary defense evidence and um, and the, and then there's not denial of necessary defense instructions. Um, we won, and also because Frank Mahady was smart and good. Um, so everything, the evidence came in the way we wanted it. The instructions were given as we wanted it. Bill Dorsch and I went off um, while the jury was deliberating, thinking we could maybe have a dinner or something. And by the time we got back, the verdict had already been um, uh, handed in and the courtroom was uproarious. So it was a great experience. Everything went right. And I don't know what the moral is, except, you know, it's worth, it's worth a shot. Mm -hmm. It's something, something to learn from. And for <clears throat> who are interested, there is a, a book about it. You can get hold of it. I have, you, I think, uh, you have to notify me. I have a box of them. <laughs> Poor Amor al Pueblo, not guilty. Okay. So uh, it uh, tells the uh, word by word transcript of the, of the court. So um, thank you. Thank you, Bill. That was, I think, really refreshing to hear some good news, even though it's from long ago. <laughs> our, our next, our, our last speaker is John LaForge, who is um, a longtime worker at, at Newquatch and uh, editor of the uh, quarterly paper, Newquatch. And it was this article that he wrote that got us going on it, uh, the bomb behind a wall of silence. And it sort of goes through the history of the ways in which the legal system has uh, excluded the necessity defense and some of the small victories. And the, the whole purpose of our talk today is to try to see whether there can be some way to penetrate this um, uh, uh, determination by the judicial system to exclude the necessity defense. Can't we sue them if they don't allow us to explain why we did something. So John, why don't you tell us um, what you discovered and also of what's happening in Germany now, which is the country with the most people doing civil disobedience, it seems to me, in, uh, next to us perhaps, or even ahead of us. Thank you, Robin, for inviting me to join you all today. Uh, it's, uh... Very interesting to be here. Yes, in Germany, where there is a long-standing campaign to oust from the territory here, U.S. deployed nuclear weapons currently held at the Bushel Air Force Base. <clears throat> it's about six hours south of where I am here in Hamburg. Um, just this Tuesday, this past Tuesday, uh, my friend Marion Kupker is one of the organizers of the campaign here, and I drove to a trial of three resistors who were charged with trespass and damage to the fence there um, in July of 2018, just coming to trial this past week. And uh, very similarly to what's happening in the US, uh, this low level court uh, pretended not to uh, find that these international treaties are relevant in his courtroom. Um, tried, as Bill explained, or Martha said in her explanation to pretend that the case is strictly about a fence, a chain link fence or some paint or blood on a piece of property and nothing about what's going on behind the fence. Um, in fact, the judge here in Kochum, Germany said twice in the course of this trial that uh, no one wants a hole cut in their garden fence, who, who would approve of that? Uh, pretending that he's an ignoramus, of course. He's not. He knows very well, as Bill said, that they can't let even a little puff of air into their vacuum that they've created around nuclear weapons protection policy because a puff of air in a vacuum destroys the vacuum. 
and then the secrets out. And just to, briefly as I can, I want to explain uh, this legal rationale for <clears throat> going into these places. It's not hard to understand. It's not hard to explain. That's why we're able to present it sometimes even without the use of lawyers. Uh, the U.S. Constitution and the German Constitution as well recognize international treaty law as superior to all domestic law. In the U.S., it's called the Supremacy Clause. Nice lofty language. It says that international treaties agreed to by the United States Senate trump everything else. They, they're superior. They override domestic, federal, and state laws. The Geneva Conventions then is a set of these treaties established as the superior law by the Constitution. Geneva Conventions forbid any deliberate attacks on civilians or civilian objects. <clears throat> that was around 1949. They've been expanded in 1977 to forbid any long-term damage to the environment. Beautiful proposition added to the Geneva Conventions. Uh, in 1946, the <clears throat> Nuremberg Principles uh, changed international law forever by applying individual responsibility to the commission of war crimes. That is, the defense of I was just following orders or the law required that I do such and such was no longer a defense if you are accused of committing crimes of war. Um, even further back, one thing I forgot is the Hague regulations of war on land uh, forbid the use of poison for any reason. So in combination, the Constitution, Geneva Conventions, Hague Regulations, and now <coughs> the Nuremberg Principles make it our individual obligation to interfere with crimes of state. One particular point adopted and imposed by the United States against German war criminals in 46 was that not just the crime of mass destruction is unlawful, but the mere planning and preparation of that crime is also unlawful before the fact. And that is our key for going in to these places, these hideous sites for the planning and preparation of mass destruction. That's all these places are. That's what they practice day in and day out. And everybody knows it. The judges know it, the prosecutors know it. That's why they try to keep these defenses out of the earshot of the jury. One case in 2004 uh, involved a Minneapolis manufacturer of depleted uranium weapons, which dispersed radioactive uranium-238 across wide areas, poisoned the soil and the water for centuries. And without any lawyers, even um, defending ourselves as non-lawyers, uh, four of us in Minneapolis, like Bill mentioned earlier, we ran into this fantastically educated judge named Jack Norby. Norby, he was well familiar with international treaty law. And uh, he allowed us to explain the whole of international treaty law to the six person jury. He allowed us to show photographs of birth abnormalities that have occurred in southern Iraq since the 1991 bombardment with depleted uranium. And uh, in a short matter of two hours, the jury found us not guilty of a trespass we freely admitted to doing. Another case that, that was a state level course, and that's probably the gist of what I want to say in answer to your question, Robin, of a strategy for moving ahead with direct action try to keep your case in state court. Um, another state court case that I'll close with, 1996, was uh, Tom Hastings and uh, Donna Howard, who uh, took down the ELF Navy transmitter system. They were allowed, again, to put on expert witnesses explaining treaty law, what these weapons can do, and <clears throat> um, what the missiles on the submarines are capable of. Um, again, um, 
we had uh, one person who's been mentioned already, uh, Francis Boyle, testified about the international treaty law. Captain James Bush, who was a submarine captain, but uh, left the Navy when the missiles became first strike weapons. He testified about first strike. And uh, a third witness, um, whose name is escaping me. Um, oh, I'm sorry, Bob Aldridge explained what the missiles are capable of. Uh, again, this was by way of explaining that these aren't defensive weapons and that charge of sabotage was laid against these two people. And in Wisconsin, sabotage to be convicted uh, involves the interference with defense of the United States. So the gist of this argument was that these weapons are offensive first strike devices and they uh, undo what deterrence is supposed to do um, by launching a initiation of a nuclear war. So the jury found them not guilty of sabotage again in state court, although they did find them guilty of damage to property. Uh, so that was only partial, partially successful. And uh, again, I guess the, uh, the case in 1984 where I was convicted of damage to a computer for a Trident submarine, again, convicted of the damage, but uh, giving the judge an opportunity to step out of the norm, break that vacuum which we, with which they protect the weapons. And at sentencing, instead of sending me away for 10 years, the judge, uh, Miles Lord, rest in peace, um, wrote a magnific magnificent speech against nuclear weapons and preparations for nuclear war. So all these actions give these judges and the prosecutors and the community an opportunity to break out of this habituation of planning and preparing for nuclear weapons war. Thanks. Wow, thank you. Thank you very much. Well, we've, we've gotten some interesting um, questions on the, uh, uh, on the chat list, but do, do any of the speakers uh, so far want to respond, uh, Martha or Bill or Bill or Bill <laughs> or, um, uh, well, let me, let me read one of these questions um, uh, with respect to um, the second speaker and speaking about the unfair exclusion of evidence. Um, the person asked, what legal arguments are made to exclude discussion of motive when that is a factor a jury should be able to judge? In other words, it, it, I think this person is asking what I've been asking, that it's illegal for judges to, to exclude this evidence uh, to, to, for you to give a fair presentation of your motives. And he's just wondering what legal arguments um, what do they make to exclude uh, discussion? I guess that's for Bill Quigley. Uh, so <clears throat> the law, the prosecutors and the judges uh, do these angels on the head of a pin arguments, which is when people say, well, look, I, I have the right to explain why I did what I did, what my motives were. Uh, the <laughs> what the, the position of the government is, motive only makes a difference if you're saying, I didn't really do this on purpose. So if it was an accident, then I can explain my motive for cutting the fence and going on to the base that I thought it was, uh, you know, my own backyard or something like that. In that case, if it was a factual mistake, we would let you put that on. But you are, you're not denying the actions you took so what, what was in your mind, where the jury is going to judge you on the actions you took, not what was in your mind, unless it was a, a mistake. Clearly, that is a very bogus approach uh, to trying to figure out what people are involved in. But that is part of the effort to silence dissent. I mean, this, this the silencing of dissent doesn't happen just in the courtrooms. It happens as everybody on this call and that no in many, many ways on many, many places. And this is where the government is just protecting itself and its own power and this, the, the, the law and order that they are invested in. 
People don't become federal judges because they have a lifetime commitment to social justice. They don't become judges because they've stood up for unpopular causes. They don't become judges because uh, they are uh, engaged in prophetic actions. You become judges because you are acceptable to a political party. They know that you will deliver uh, when, when, they, when called upon. And often uh, these days, particularly, so many of the judges are people who were prosecutors before. Um, and so their, their, uh, their whole life has been um, defending the status quo and trying to uh, <clears throat> stifle dissent in whatever way they can. And so those are the kinds of arguments that they make. There seem to be irrational arguments, but uh, if the prosecutor and the judge agree, then uh, they don't become irrational anymore. They become binding on those of us who are in front of the case. And this is what Martha Hennessy was talking about earlier in terms of it's not really a trial. In some cases, it's a puppet show. And, you know, we're the puppets. Occasionally, uh, uh, as Bill and John have explained, you, you get to a judge who has a real conscience. You get to a judge who's really interested in the issues and really willing to let the people decide what's going on. And marvelous things can happen. And even, I would say this, that even in the case where Martha and the rest of the seven, um, rest of the seven tried this, they held hearings. We had bishops speaking, they had uh, information from Francis Boyle that the, the process of trying to speak truth to power, even if power doesn't want to hear it, the process of speaking truth to power is very engaging and energizing for the dozens of other people who come to the courtroom, the dozens of other people in the various communities where people come from. Like, so it, it's part of the fight and uh, it's an important part of the fight to educate everybody. And it's often horrifying to people who are not in, engaged in these fights all along how uh, dim, dim the courts take the obligation to listen to justice. So that may be longer answer than asked for, but. Mm -hmm. hmm. Robin, can I put? Yeah. I think the question was about what arguments do the prosecution make, and they make a number of, number of them, including you know, um, what, what Bill just said. Um, but the, the scariest one, the most, at least in state courts, at least in Vermont, I don't really know more than Vermont, is the argument that if the legislature, if the government, our democratically elected government, has decided that something is okay, is not a harm, then the defendant claiming a necessity defense who has to show a, that the harm um, he or she seeks to prevent is greater than the crime that they're being charged with, that doesn't, that's not allowed because our government said it's not a, it's not a crime, it's not a harm. So <clears throat> I think there's a recent Vermont case where a, a mother needed to, needed to have marijuana to give to her child as a, as a medication. Nobody questioned her sincerity or the necessity, of, but, but the majority, it was a three to two case, the majority said, but Vermont has outlawed the possession of marijuana and they've they had recently created some provisions for um, medicinal use of marijuana, but there was, those were strictly limited, and the defendant didn't, you know, didn't comply with that law. So, because the legislature has spoken, nobody can be heard to say that there was a need. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, there's one other uh, interesting question. Um, I don't know who would be good to answer this. Can preemptive strike be considered defensive in international law? Is that who who asked that? <coughs> uh, you mean a preemptive strike with nuclear weapons? Uh, well, the, isn't that what they argue? In other words, that's uh, they're just defending us and by uh, having the option of a <laughs> preemptive strike. Isn't that part of the argument of, of uh, the military now? Uh, 
Well, that's that's the mental gymnastics that the military wants us to do. But uh, yeah. deterrence theory that they supposedly adhere to is that once you're struck, then you will reply with such devastating force that no one will ever strike you in the first place. And a first strike preemptive thing does exactly what deterrence is supposed to prevent. So uh, it was pretty easy to explain to the jury that it's offensive and not defensive to plan a first strike. Mm. Yeah. Um, okay, so I think we have a few more minutes if uh, we want to whatever, um, undo the, the muting uh, and other people want to ask a question. As I say, we were trying to sort of squeeze this into one hour so that it fits into, you know, one hour on public uh, television. And so we're just about there. I think it's been fantastic so far. Um, who would like to say something? I see Sandy there. Go, yeah, go ahead, Sandy. Yeah. It was great to see Bill Nelson again. Uh, he was a great attorney then, and I'm sure he is now. Um, and I was very grateful to be able to participate in the Winooski 44. It was my understanding, and I guess I have this question for Bill as well, uh, Bill Quigley as well. It seemed to me that in the Winooski 44, the argument was from the prosecution that all the state had to do was to prove uh, to prove the elements of unlawful, unlawful trespass. In other words, that you were there without permission, and that if the state proved that that you were there without the permission uh, and knew that you were trespassing, <laughs> that's all the state needed to prove, and there really is no defense, in a way. Uh, except to say I didn't know it was trespass, I didn't know that I was trespassing, or that, you know, that there, that the state actually agreed in some way to allow the necessity defense. Is that the way you remember it, Bill, or not? I think I, I could be wrong, but I think that the state said, go ahead, say whatever you have to say, but when it comes to, um, to the, the, the jury instructions, when it comes to the jury charge conference, we will oppose any instruction on a necessity defense and and and, and argue for a conviction and, and instruction that if they did the, the act, regardless of their motives, um, they're guilty. But Mahadi didn't. Yeah. didn't right, right. God right. bless him. Yeah, okay. Um, I have to leave. I can't thank you all enough. This is a crop. <laughs> thank you for doing a great job as moderator and. Anyway, we should figure out a way, obviously, to use the necessity defense more and more. Thank you all. Bye-bye. All right. So I'd Thanks. like to, um, uh, in closing, uh, well, thank everyone, but also invite you to look at the, um, the, the timeline uh, because uh, we have a number of events coming up this year. The next one uh, is um, Phyllis, Phyllis Binnis, who has written a book. <coughs> About the United Nations, and she's going to um, uh, talk about the founding of the United Nations, what happened then. Um, we have a multiple, multiple perspectives on that. In fact, my Aunt Georgia went to the, the founding of the United Nations in San Francisco as a representative of world government. Uh, she was very disillusioned with what happened there. But uh, Phyllis, I think, has a very um, uh, studied and excellent uh, look at this. But of course, in the discussion with her, we will bring it up to today and, and what the S Secretary General has said recently about, hey, let's have a ceasefire. So that has been getting some traction and Wilf is very much in support of that idea. So any other closing comments? Folks this, hi, Robin. Good. Great, Go you're doing a great job. Um, I just wanted to say that I put the uh, link to the timeline into the chat window. Uh, it's close to the bottom. Uh huh. Okay. So people can, if you go in there and click on it, then you'll have it on in your browser. Uh huh. And can anyone? Uh, will it be staying there for a while or? Well, people can copy this chat window if they want to and paste it. Is that the way? The, the chat window probably won't be staying, you know. 
we're sort of novices at this, so wonderful. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much. And um, I know Martha and Bill have been, you know, sort of uh, uh, on, on television for the last few weeks. And I hope the word is getting out. And I hope you have some time to rest. And I hope you have a lot of folks at the at the uh, sentencing that will make sure that uh, the judge cannot make a bad decision. <laughs>